My name is Yoshi Kasaka. I own a garage company since 1989. We have a lot of vintage motorcycle display and then a lot of vintage memorabilia. My trademark in doing these bikes is 1800 piece. And I run into it at auctions now and then people come up to me and say, well, did you do this? And did you do that? And I try and be as polite as I could be. And I say, sir, there's only 1800 pieces in one of these Triumphs. And I have handled every one of them at least two or three times. Restoration is not easy. You know, you have to make sure every step is correct, every part is right. Every, everything is checked thoroughly. And if it's not perfect, it's renewed. Why is bad, you cannot ride it. You cannot start either. If it's a good motor with bad wire, it, you're done. One time a friend of mine named Ned Coletti, who was with the San Francisco Giants, asked if I would speak at one of their chapel services. And I said, yeah. And so he said, if I would like, I could actually take batting practice at AT&T Park that John Yandel, the guy who would normally pitch batting practice for Barry Bonds, would throw for me. Now, I'd never played organized baseball when I was growing up, but we used to play in a vacant lot across the street from where I grew up. And there was a kid named Steve Snail in our neighborhood who was the best pitcher around. And when we were fifth grade or so, I hit him better than anybody else in the neighborhood. Of course, there was only one other kid in the neighborhood, and she was in the first grade. But I was still the best. I thought, I did pretty good against Snail. It'll be interesting to see how I measure up against like professional caliber pitching. So the day arrived. It was quite amazing to take batting practice right there at AT&T Park. And um, you had to wound up and let go of the ball. And the next thing that I knew, it was hitting the net behind me. And I thought, I'm going to have to start my swing, like early. So he wound up, and I started earlier this time, and it still ended up in the net. I started swinging earlier and earlier. Eventually, when he would go into his windup, I would begin my swing. And um, I hit a few foul balls and maybe a couple of dribblers that might have gone fair. And I thought I was doing pretty good because I figured he's working hard to just show me up. And then he said to me, would you like me to put a little zip on one? And I realized those had actually been his lobs. And so I said to him, yeah, go ahead. It's kind of hard to time these slower pitches. And um, he let go with a pitch, and I never even saw it. And um, so I asked him to try to get some sense of where I stood in baseball performance. Like, who's able to hit that pitch? He said, oh, a good high school player could, could smack it. I was depressed. And he went on, you know, uh, a decent college pitcher strike out a high school guy with his eyes closed. And a good minor leaguer would mop up college guys. And you put a major league arm in there, it gets ugly real fast. And all of a sudden, I realized the vast chasm that existed between Sandlot Ball on Brennanwood Terrace in Rockford, Illinois, and a major league professional at AT&T Park. John actually sent a scouting report about me to Ned Coletti. John Ortberg bats right, throws right, took 10 minutes of batting practice. As a hitter, John makes a good pastor. It's interesting, there was a study a few years ago done that showed the first sign of incompetence is our inability to perceive incompetence. But I think nowhere does this inability to have an objective, accurate, reality-based view of our performance show itself more than when it comes to the spiritual realm. 
When it comes to my moral character, to the purity of my heart, the duplicity of my actions, how many of us have ever tried to like benchmark our performance? How many of us have given serious thought to how our lives would grade out? Not by the standard of neighborhood sandlots where I can always find a first grader to outperform, but in the eyes of a holy, just, righteous, truth-telling God. And that's why the most dangerous force in the world is not sickness or injury or even violence. It's sin. Sin is the deadliest force because it takes me out of the flow of the Spirit. Now, there's a little phrase been around a long time, original sin. The Bible never actually uses that phrase, but the writers of Scripture and any moderately perceptive observer know that we are remarkably prone to do things that we know are wrong. And then added to this, we have a staggering capacity for self-deception and self-justification. There is a kind of original sin in another sense. Your sin is intimately connected to the passions and wiring God gave you. Your sin doesn't look quite the same as anybody else's, like your fingerprints or your bowling style. Your sin pattern is unique to you. We don't get tempted by things that repulse us. Temptation rarely begins by trying to get you to do something that is 180 degrees in the opposite direction of your values. What tempts you starts close to home with the passions and desires that God has hardwired into you and then tries to pull you about five degrees off course. And that subtle deviation is enough to disrupt the flow of the Spirit in my life. So coming to recognize that pattern of sins most tempting to you, your signature sin, is one of the most important steps of your spiritual life. My life has certain patterns and relationships, temperament, gifts, things that are unique to me, and yours does too. And the pattern of our sin is related to the pattern of our gifts. It's a critical thing to learn the patterns at the core of the me you want to be and the corresponding sin patterns, because no one is more vulnerable than the person who lacks self-awareness. Jesus warned about people who go around trying to take specks out of other people's eyes while not noticing the two-by-four in their own. My signature sin is my own two-by-four, so appealing to me that it's my biggest danger, so close to me that I'm apt not to see it. Knowing your signature pattern tells you something about what you need to be most fully spiritually alive. All of us face temptation. All of us give in. Here's what's most important. When you mess up, when you sin, when you find yourself out of the flow, jump back in. This is God's will for your life and God has made provision. Uh, not too long ago, we had a child graduate from Azusa Pacific University, and there was a moment there I'll never forget. Um, John Wallace, who was the president of Azusa Pacific, pulled three students into the center of the room, and he told a little group of us that were gathered there before commencement about how these graduating seniors were gonna be serving under-resourced people in impoverished areas of the world for several years after graduation. They told us a little bit about where they were going and why, and we applauded. And they thought that's why they were there, but it wasn't. That moment, John turned his back to the rest of us, faced those three students, and told them the real reason they were present. Somebody you do not know has heard what you're doing, John said. He wants you to be able to serve the people where you're going without any barrier, so he has given a gift. He's asked to remain anonymous, but here's what he has done for you. And then John looked each student in the eye and called each one by name. He looked at the first student, never forget this moment, and said to her, you have been forgiven your school debt of $105,000. It took a few moments for the words to sink in. The student shook her head at first. The thought registered. She began to cry at the sheer unexpected generosity of a mountain of debt wiped out in a moment by somebody she had never met. And then John turned to the next student, you've been forgiven your debt of 70,000. 
And then John turned to the third student. By this time, she knew what was coming, but it was if she could not believe it was happening until she heard the words. And John said to him, you have been forgiven your debt of $130,000. All three students were trembling. Their lives had been changed in a moment by the extravagant generosity of somebody they had never met. And all of us who were in that room, who watched, were so moved. It was like we experienced the forgiveness ourselves. There was not a dry eye in the room. And I wanted so badly to say, hey, I have a daughter who's graduating this weekend. An unpayable debt, an unseen giver, an unforgettable gift. That's grace. That's the joy of forgiveness. This is a bigger debt that we label under, and we give it words like regret or guilt or shame or brokenness, sin. God was in Jesus reconciling the world to himself. And we know what's coming, but we need to hear the words. Forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. You will face temptations. Sometimes you will mess up in sin. You need to hear the words. You need to get back into the flow. Forgiven.